went back to my office, and I did also figure out how to work the dot cam. This is the book I was um, talking about. A Dictionary of Selected Synonyms in the Principal Indo-European Languages. And we're going to look at some of these in, uh, in a few minutes, kind of as we make our way through um, Grimm's Law and the rest of talking about the Germanic languages and their place in um, Indo-European. Even though I've got Grimm's Law here, I want to sorry, I want to um, skip it for a moment and go down to the seven characteristics of Germanic languages. Okay? These are these are ways that the Germanic languages are all closely related that differentiate them from all the other Indo-European languages. Okay? These are seven characteristics that distinguish all of Ger the Germanic languages from all of the other Indo-European languages. Okay? So, first one. Shared common distinctive vocabulary. Okay? Words, for example, common among all the Germanic languages that are not cognate to the other Indo-European languages. And I'll try and point a couple of, out when we look at um, the dictionary of selected synonyms. One, just top of my head, is the word for God. The word for God is not, the, old, the Germanic word for God is not cognate to any of the other Indo-European languages. All of their words for God are cognates. It's, and we have no idea why. We have no idea why any of these things are the way they are. Okay? I mean, if, if, you, if you went on and studied philology, historical linguistics, and you discovered the reason why, for example... Germanic, the very next thing. Germanic has a two-tense verb system. And you could prove it. Um, I mean, you would literally get your name in the nightly news. You would be famous. And you would have your, if you wanted it, your chair of historical linguistics at any of the top universities in the world. And I mean Cambridge, Oxford, the Sorbonne, Harvard, you name it. Because... Each of these are things that we would like to know why they happen, but we, we don't. Okay? So, common shared distinctive vocabulary is number one. Two, two-tense verb system. Okay? We actually only have two tenses in modern English. We have past tense and we have present tense. We don't literally, truly have a future tense. What do I mean by that? We can make the past tense of a verb by doing what to it? We do one of two things. Nope, not for past tense. We add an ed ending, okay? Or, yeah, we change the form of the verb itself. We go from I swim to I swam, okay? Or we go from I walk to I walked. What do we do to make I swim future? I will swim or I shall swim. Okay? We have to use another verb entirely, what's called a modal auxiliary, in order to create that future tense. The other Indo-European languages don't. Latin doesn't. Latin throws on if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I've studied Latin. Uh, if you wanted to use the verb for praise, um, singular present tense for Latin for I praise would be laudo. The O ending is indicating it's me. If it's, you know, tomorrow, it's, if I remember correctly, it's laudawi, L A U D A V I. That's indicating, the A V I is indicating. Tomorrow, I will be doing this. Okay? Notice, you say that with one word, though. Similarly, 
to show how the inflections work, this doesn't have to do with the, the tense as much. If you wanted to say, um, you know, in English, you can say um, something like, by tomorrow evening, I shall have finished my paper. Okay, that's a future, future perfect progressive, something like that. Okay, in Latin, you do that with one word. You do that with one tense of a verb, where you just add on the appropriate inflection. So, two tense verb system. Now, there have been theories offered as to why Germanic only has two, past and present. In one of those theories, which I kind of like, I have no idea if it's accurate. I mean, if it's if it's the right reason. One of the theories kind of offered deals with Germanic mythology. Okay, what, how much? What do you know of Germanic mythology? Anything? Okay. In Germanic mythology, there will come a day called Ragnarok. Okay, R A G N O R A K. It's the end of the world. At Ragnarok, all the forces of good and light and order will go to war against all the forces of evil and darkness and chaos. Okay? In most of the versions of Germanic mythology that survive, in terms of you know written stories and things like that, evil, dark, and chaos wins. Good is overcome. Good is destroyed. So, if you've seen the Thor films, think Thor with the Frost Giants, and the Frost Giants win. The frost Giants are part of Germanic mythology. It's Frost Giants, it's Elves, it's Orcs, it's Loki, it's the Midgard Serpent, etc. They, in most of the stories, win. So what does that tell you about the future? <laughs> pretty bleak. I mean, and it's been, I'll get to your question in just a minute. It's, it, that's been taken as possibly one of the reasons why the Germanic literature and Germanic uh, heroic character is so insistent upon earning glory now, here. Because the only thing you have going for you is what people say about you after you're dead. Okay. Because once you're dead, there's not much to look forward to. Now, in the story of Ragnarok, in the Germanic myth of Ragnarok, if you're a warrior and you die here on Earth before Ragnarok, what are called the Valkyries, which means the slaughter um, carriers, these kind of female spirits who come take the slain from the battlefields, they take you off to a place called Valhalla, V-A-L-H-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. It's the hall, Hala, of the Val, the slain. It's where the dead warriors all go. And they sit there and they party until Ragnarok. And a Ragnarok comes, the living and the dead, on the side of good. Fight, the living and the dead, on the side of bad and bad wins. Okay? I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to Old English because the story of the coming of Christianity to Anglo-Saxon England um, as recorded by the medieval writer Bede may give us a little indication of this story and why one of the pagan Germanic priests essentially says I'm going to follow this Christ guy because he talks about his religion to some extent. You had a question or comment? Uh, you said most of what I was. Oh, okay. I had the wolf part. Okay. So. Yeah, Fenris Ulf I also f forgot about. Um, you know, look at our, our days of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Monday, Mondag. It's the day of the moon. Okay? It's Germanic. Tuesday, it's Tuesday. Day T I W apostrophe S. It's from the Germanic god Tu. Another spelling of his name is Tyr. 
who gets his hand bitten off by Fenris Ulf when Loki is trying to set Ragnarok into motion. And he wants to free Fenris Ulf. Tyr sticks his hand in his mouth to stop him from becoming free. Okay. Wednesday, Woden's Day. Thursday, Son of Woden's Day. Thor's Day. Friday, Frigg's Day. And then Saturday and Sunday aren't really um, Germanic at all. But the five days of the, the, the weekdays of the week um, do come from Germanic. Okay. So, next item, the third item. How do we form our past tenses? Well, we've got two different kinds of verbs. We have what are called weak verbs and strong verbs. Weak verbs form the past tense with a dental suffix, a t or d. But we don't call those weak verbs today, do we? What are they called? Anybody know? Those are called regular verbs. Why? Because they're very regular. You create a new word in modern English. When new verbs enter the language, they are automatically this form. They're automatically weak verbs. Okay? You interface with your computer. Yesterday you interfaced with your computer. You Google, you Googled, okay? Or you Yahoo, you Yahooed. Everything, okay, that is made into a verb today, it's made into a weak verb. It's very simple to remember. This is what, you know, when, when infants are learning to speak, this is what they do in an English speaker's home, okay? Where they start to have problems is with words like bring because it becomes I bringed rather than I brought I bring brang brought brang is actual and proper older form okay I think I thinked I thought I catch I caught Every now and then, even a couple of my college student children will say, catched. I catched a cold. I'm like, what? Okay. <laughs> so, all weak verbs. Okay, no, notice, this isn't just English. This is all Germanic languages. All weak verbs in Germanic languages form the past tense by adding a dental suffix. Strong verbs have a vowel change. It's, what's co it's called oblaut. Okay. And it's a vowel change that has a what's called a gradation of vowels. That is, the vowels historically change significantly. Okay? You wouldn't just have, like modern English, swim, swam, swum. You'd have swim, swam, swum on, and then often swum in. You'd have an O-N and an E-N or A-N ending as well. Okay? But, as we saw with Canterbury, those endings start to drop off. Okay? So, the strong verb part isn't important here. It's the weak verbs. All weak verbs form dental suffix for pre uh, preterite tense. Okay? What else? Proto-Germanic had a system of weak and strong adjectives. Okay, so we've, had, we've got weak and strong verbs. We've got weak and strong adjectives. The terminology, by the way, came, comes from Jacob Grimm of Grimm's Brothers fame. He just needed a way to classify. And he thought two easy binaries, weak, strong. He could have called it short, tall. But that you know, implies size and would be kind of odd. So, an adjective is weak when it's preceded by a demonstrative pronoun or and or a definite article. Okay? It also, the adjective, will have a weak ending, as you're going to see in just a second. And yet, adjective is strong if it stands alone with the noun it modifies. For example, weak. It should be a, that D-A should be one of those 
Evs should be a D with a line through it. Should be Tha Yungun Cherlas. Okay? The A N ending on the word Yung is the weak inflection. Segoda Kuning, the E on the God, is the weak inflection. Look at the strong example. Yonge Cherlas, it's an E. It's not A N. Okay? The other one, God. No, no inflection, inflectional affix at all. Okay, so I, if you're looking at a text, how do you know if an adjective is weak or strong? Look at what's in front of it. Does it have a demonstrative, a pronoun, or a definite article? Okay, if it does, it's weak. Now, you translate those the exact same way. Whether it's weak or strong doesn't doesn't matter, doesn't determine how you translate. Okay? So here's where it gets kind of tricky. An adjective can be weak or strong. It all depends on its context, how it's being used. Okay? And adjectives have to agree with the noun they modify. In case number in gender. Okay? So for example, you don't say, um, the mini dog, I've actually had papers that had things like that, the mini dog went home. No, you'd say the mini dogs. Our L.I. lives? Okay, are important, not our life are important. Unless you're talking our life collectively, in which case, what form of the verb are you going to have? Our life is important, exactly. Okay, you'd be amazed, you know, with freshman writing, uh, the problems with adjectives with case number and gender. Next item Germanic languages have. First syllable stress. Of the Indo-European languages, they're the only ones that have first syllable stress. And again, we don't know why. So, for example, the name of the guy, the Hun, who attacked and sacked Rome. It's not Attila, with the accent on the second syllable. It's Attila. Attila, the Hun. Okay? All English words, or almost all English words that are of Germanic origin have this first syllable stress. History, not history. Okay? Lawyer, not lawyer. Okay? Even words like, you know, I'll take, take that back. I was going to say even words like attorney. But that one is often stressed on the second syllable because it's French. Okay? Um, and I've given you some modern example, and you've got the comment from your book. Exceptions are words like modern believe and forget, because that initial prefix is not important. Or a word that begins with in or un. Okay? Modern German, tragen, meaning to carry, wissen, to know, sprechen, to say, beginnen, to begin, geschichte, not the ge, history, and then, you know, even the English Translations there, carry, okay, not begin as much, history. Next item, a vowel shift. And this, this is probably the hardest of the seven things to remember. Because you get two here and they're almost the opposite of each other. Okay? A vowel shift from Proto-Indo-European, if you want, to Proto-Germanic. That is... Indo-European short o becomes Proto-Germanic short a. Examples. Indo-European gosti, meaning guest, becomes modern German gast, also guest. Latin octo, German acht. Okay. Octo, acht. Okay. O to a. 
And then the other side of it is Proto-Indo-European long ah becomes Germanic long o. Oh. Proto-Indo-European brachter, Germanic, modern English, well, me Germanic. Brodor, Old English, Brodor. Latin, mater, Old English, modor. Okay? That's, again, that's probably going to be the, well, other than Grimm's Law. That'll be the hardest one to remember. And then the last one. What's called the first sound shift. Okay? Also known as Grimm's Law. It's the major shift in certain consonant sounds from Proto-Indo-European to Proto-Germanic. And I'll just use... I don't think if the... I don't remember if these are the same examples I gave up above or not. But we'll go here first. So, Grimm's Law occurs in three steps. Okay? Again, we have no idea why this happens. So, Indo-European aspirated voiced stops become Proto-Germanic unaspirated voiced stops. Okay. So, you can either use what's on the chart or on the notes, or you can look at this Oops. and see, just using Latin as the example, Um, there, Indo-European aspirated voice stops become Germanic. So, ba becomes Germanic ba. Da, Germanic da. And ga, Germanic ga. Examples. Brater, brother. We don't have any aspiration any longer. Breg, break. De, do. Dwer, door. Ghosty, guest. Gad, get. And we could use, I mean, we could use some Latin um, examples for some of the Indo-European, okay, but I just got these pretty much straight out of the dictionary of Indo-European roots, okay. That's the first step. What does that mean? That means that these Indo-European sounds, these aspirated voice stops, lose, okay, that voicing, Excuse me, lose that aspiration. Okay? They lose that aspiration. So notice what is still there. You still have the b, d, g parts, because that's going to be important. Okay? Indo European voiceless stops, step two, become Proto Germanic voiceless fricatives. So, p becomes f becomes f and k becomes h. Examples. Ped, foot. Pisk, fish. Treas, three. Turba, thorpe. Cared, heart. Kel, hell. Okay. And, you, and if you look up that word kel, for example, in the Indo-European Dictionary, it's amazing what words we get from that. Okay, I mean, obviously we have there the word hell. Where is hell supposed to be? It's down below, right? It's hidden. Guess what other words are related to that kel? You might have one in your home. A cellar. Because where is that? 
It's down below. If you have a concealed carry permit, you probably have something that you put your weapon in. It's called a holster. It's related. Because what does it do? It hides the thing that you're carrying. Part of this, the root meaning of this word is something hidden. Okay? Um, you could probably think of other examples of the P to F. I'll try and pull some up in the book. The T to Th. You know. Um, Indo-European voice stops. Step three. Become Germanic voiceless stops. Okay, now, here's where you have to be careful. Because this makes it sound, if you follow these in order, okay, the first one, you drop the aspiration, but you're still left with the ba da ga, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the third one, your ba da ga, becomes pa ta ka. So, little application of common sense would say, well, then, in Germanic languages, what sounds should we not have? B, D, G. It's because they don't necessarily occur chronologically like this. For example, the first one that I've given you up there, I've got that process conflated. Okay. That's a process that occurred probably over a thousand years or longer, and it occurred in a couple of steps. Okay? The way most people represent it in notes like these is they just conflate it and show it as a single step to make it easier. If you, um, I'm pretty sure the textbook has the full breakdown of the steps, and it actually makes this three-step into process into about a five-step process and almost impossible to remember. Let me, um, let me go back up here. Yeah, I do give a couple of different more examples for words. So look at some of these other examples. Um, for the Indo-European aspirated voice stops becoming Proto-Germanic unaspirated voice stops. Okay, word of advice for the exam. You need to know the terminology. You need to know Indo-European aspirated voiced stops. Okay, you need to know the um, phonetic symbols, the B and the H within virgules, and what they become. Okay, because you got to understand this in order to understand some of the Germanic stuff that we get to later, and to understand the relationship between modern English and Germanic words and Latin words. Because knowing this, you can pick up some Latin words and look at them and go, okay, now I remember, you know, that second step. Indo-European p becomes f. So a word that begins in Latin with a p ought to begin in Germanic with an f. And that can apply all the time. A word that begins in Latin with a sound, like cardiac, <coughs> ought to begin in English or Germanic with a h sound, like heart. It's the same thing. Uh, Germanic, uh, excuse me, Latin, caput, means your head. Germanic, helvod. It works all the way across almost. Okay? So, brater, broder, we already looked at that one. Um, bag, Berg, meaning Berg, mountain. Ble, blauen. Guess what that verb is? To blow. Okay. Ber, beron, to bear, to carry. Behen, Old English, bindan, to bind. Indo-European, duh, becomes just duh. Dehel, del. Dhoer, Duru, door. Red, red. Red there doesn't mean to read. It means to advise, to counsel. Okay? And if the Old English word and sound and spelling throws you off, it's because of the changes from Old English to Modern English. Once you understand those changes, 
it'll be clear. Okay? Beharda, Old English beard, a beard. Drag, Old English dragon, from which we get modern English to draw. Not this kind of draw, but to like drag after you, to draw behind you. Okay? Uh, Hair, Old English derk. And then the GHs. Gahav, Old English. This one's a little different. Yevon. There's a thing that happens in Germanic between the time of Gothic and Old English where that G, the G sound, becomes what's called palatalized. Okay? But the old the Indo-European Ghas, Old English Ghos, what do you think that is? Goose. Okay. Great vowel shift. Remember the first night of class, I talked about the vowels kind of shift. They move up. O, U. Okay. Um, look at the second step. P becomes F. Well, we already did ped and foot. Past. Old English fast. Doesn't mean quickly. It means firm, strong, like a fast hold or holding fast to something. Okay, um, pure Old English fear, like pyromaniac, pyromaniac, a fire lover. You know, uh, plek Old English flex, that's like flax, flaxseed, Old Norse. Uh, excuse me, old um, Indo-European plot, Old Norse flatter, flat, paired, had to throw one kind of scatological one, Old English fairton. I've got a, a um, asterisk there because that Old English fairton, this is actually from the uh, Indo-European dictionary, it's to fart, okay? <laughs> It doesn't show up in any written material. But they give it anyways. Um, t to th. Terse. Thirst. Treb. Thorpe. Thorpe is like the name of a town. Or a uh, set, uh, settlement. Tong. Old English. Thunkian. Thanks. Ten. Old English thin, and they didn't use the word tin. Um, it's not, the Old English thin is not the word for tin. Uh, Indo European ka, to ha, carrot and heart we've talked about, kel and hell we've talked about, quo, Old English hua, ah, it, that vowel elongates, okay, that ah sound, if you had that vowel triangle at the center of your mouth, okay, all it's right down at the bottom. It's low. Your tongue's low. Bottom of your mouth. Ah. And when that vowel moves from the great vowel shift, it moves up on this side of that triangle. So ah, oh, wa, ho, who, who. Kaito, Old English hath, which is modern English heath. Uh, Kylo, Old English hal, which means health or wellness. Cod, Old English heta. Third step. Ba to pa. This is a hard one because if you look in the Old English or in the um, Indo European dictionary, it's not thought that many words began with an initial ba sound in Indo European. So abel. Old English apple, bend, pen, that's feather, kind of pen. Behu, Old English pock, like pox, a blister, a pustule kind of a thing. Bach, Old English pega, a peg, and then Latin bursa, purse. De to te, dwell to two, dent, tooth. Ed, and notice it's got a little um, 
like a hyphen after it, that's because it's thought, you know, there's going to be an ending on that word. Old English, eton, to eat. Okay. Dreu, Old English, trow, that's tree. Uh, dial, Old English, dalan, like to deal. What are you actually doing when you're dealing cards? It's separating. I mean, dal means to distinguish between, to separate. Okay? And then del, Old English, telon, which means to tell. Ga to ka. Gno, Old English, knauen, to know. Gwen, Old English, quene, Modern English, queen. Gal, Old Norse, kala. I don't know why I've got that so small. Old English, uh, Indo European, gemb. Old English, com, com. Uh, gerb, Old English, caravan, to carve. And then, gel, Old English, keld. Cold. Okay. So, for Grimm's Law, you need to know this terminology. Okay. You need to know these symbols. Indo European B becomes Germanic P. Indo European D becomes Germanic T, etc. For each of the three steps. I mean, I've done the exam differently just about every time I teach the class. Sometimes I put, give me the three steps of Grimm's Law, and I'll, I'll say Indo-European, leave it blank, becomes, leave it blank, for step one, step two, step three. Okay? Um, I don't usually say, give me an example like this, but you will need to be able to do this kind of thing and this kind of thing for each of those three steps, okay? Um, just briefly, I think that's, it's all, no, it's not all there is. Before we look at some of the um, synonyms, here are some comparative Germanic languages, okay? You've got Gothic from the fourth century, okay? This is the Lord's Prayer. In Gothic, it's the Lord's Prayer from around 840 A.D. Uh, Gothic in Old English, 9th century, probably around 850. And then Gothic from um, not quite Old High German, but almost from around 1000 A.D. Okay, Let me do the Old English first. Fad ure thuth art. Sorry, I'm used to doing the one I know. Fad ure thu art on heavenum, si thin nama ye halgod. Tobekoma thin riche, ye worthy thin wheel on erdan, swa swa on heavenum. Una yadai huamlichen hlaf, silo us to die. And for yiv us ur yiltas, swa swa we for yiv of urm yiltendum. And they yelled to us on Kostnunga, Ak eluz us of Uvele. That's one pronunciation. Let me do another one. Fader Ure, through the art on Helvenum, seeth in Nama Yahalgod, to become it in Riche, ye worthy in Wheel on Erdan, swa swa on Helvenum. Urna yadai huamli kan hlaf, sila us to die. And forgive us. Ur guilt us, swa swa we forgive us, uh, forgive us, urum guiltandum, a ne lad to us on costuma, ak eluse us of uvile. The difference between the two was in the pronunciation of a couple of C's and G's, okay? Because there's disagreement among scholars as to when you, what's called, palatalize the C's and G's, and some when you don't. We'll talk about that more when we get to um, Old English. But you can go right down through these without even knowing the pronunciation and start to fairly well notice, okay, what words are the same? Fadar, fader, fater, 
is usa unser, okay, unsar thu. You don't see the thu there, but you have the thu there, and you have du there. Modern German, it's du also, okay. Notice this is a much this is kind of a longer version of the Lord's Prayer. It adds, it has more than does the traditional kind of King James um, version. And I think the last one we had in here was just, yeah, all those. Okay. Last few minutes. Ten after eight. Just so to show some similarities among these Indo-European languages. I'm going to try and get this to go as big as I can. Because this is really small print. Unfortunately... It's also really out of focus. Um, word for thunder. Okay, you got Greek, which I can't read, and then you have New Greek, and then Latin tonitrus, Italian tuono, French tonera, Spanish. Okay, French, Italian, Spanish are all der derivative of Latin. So Latin tonitrus, Irish, uh, Romanian, sorry, tunet, and then Irish taurine, and then couple other forms of Celtic, uh, New Irish, Welsh, Breton, Gothic, Fehu, Fe it looks like. And then Old Norse, Swedish, Old English, Thunor, Modern English, New English, Dutch, Old High German, etc. Lithuanian, Perkunas, Perkunas, Church Slavonic. Notice the Church Slavonic and the other Slavic languages. They're similar among themselves, but they're different than the others. Notice the similarity between the Germanic and even the Italic. They both begin with t sound. Okay, probably is an indication. Um, and the the languages here, those initial consonants, that's part of a sound law. Probably what that's indicating is thunder was common wherever the Indo-European homeland was. Okay, so it kind of you know rules out the Sahara Desert. Um, it doesn't. It also rules in an awful lot of stuff. Another one. Which one was this? Oh yeah. This one I was going to do fire. Okay, you've got, skip the Greek, oh man, I can barely read that, uh, Ignis, and then all of the Latin derived begin with f, okay, um, man, why is that so, okay, Gothic starts with f, and then Danish and Swedish, Swedish with a vowel, Old English with f, okay, Look at the Church Slavonic, uh, the CHSL. Ogni, look at Lithuanian. Ugnis, look at Latin. Ignis, notice the similarity? A vowel, a g, a uh, nasal, and then another vowel. Okay, That's indicating a relationship. That the, the word is definitely um, related. The Germanic ones, all seem to be off on their own, okay, in terms of the ire and all that kind of stuff. Um, one that would be probably much more common I 
does it fairly well. You have father and mother and parents. Look at the similarity, well, for both father and mother. Okay. Why common sense? Why would those terms be cognate? I mean, pair, uh, pater, padre, pair, padre, etc. They they're derived. Father, 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 father. You know, because of Grimm's law, pa becomes fa. Okay. Um, Middle High German, the V comes in at that point. Um, Lithuanian. Okay. Tieva. Um, I'm trying to remember what L E T T stands around. I can't off the top of my head. Um, and then you've got the Polish, the Church Slavonic, the S South Croatian, I think, and the Russian have a little bit of difference in that they begin with a vowel, but then you go back up to Irish, a new Irish. And notice they both begin with a vowel. Okay, so that's, you know, again, that's indicating that there's some relationship there. But then you go down to Sanskrit and Avestan, pitar, pitar. Go back up to Latin, pater. And the Greek is also pater. Okay. So those are all clearly related. Look at the mother. They almost all begin with m. Okay. Go from that one to that. This is... Son and daughter. Sanskrit, down at the very bottom. Sunnu. And Putra, Avastan. Um, Putra and Hunu. Okay. Where Sanskrit often has a s sound, Avastan sometimes has a h huh sound. But then you have Russian, Sun, Polish, Sun, uh, Bohemian, I think that is, Sun, Church Slavonic, Sunu. Well, that's like Sanskrit. It's also like the Germanic, and it's also like, uh, well, the Gothic, and the Dutch and such. Phileus, uh, notice Latin Phileus. Uh, Italian, Figlio, French, etc., etc. And then look at the Celtic branch. Mac, Mac, Mab, Mab. Okay. That's an, a, um, that would be an example of where Celtic has its own distinctive, okay, vocabulary. Look at the daughter. You have tuz and does, okay. Sanskrit, Duhitar, Avastan, Dugadar, again, Latin, Philia, but then Germanic, Dahtar. Well, the Germanic is closest to the Sanskrit and the Avastan there. Right? And you can go through every word in this book, and it's... This is... Photo reduced if you've never seen something like this. It's 1500 pages. Okay. In uh, probably like 600 pages. Um, you could go through every entry like this and try to come up with all of these relationships. And the closest that, that folks have come to, that's why I was going to have that one book. Um, closest we've come to are, you've got, yeah, here's one. I won't show you those others. You have here a kind of a, what's called a wave theory model. Shrink this so I can get it up here. Showing, this is kind of showing the relationships among 
the various groups. Notice this circle, okay, for Indo-Iranian and Armenian and Balto-Slavic. That's indicating that those three groups are somehow related. Notice Germanic and Balto-Slavic are related. Last week I mentioned both Germanic and the Balto-Slavic languages form their date of plurals with the um ending. Okay. Notice Celtic and Italic have a common circle around them. Okay. And Greek and Italic have a common circle around them. But Celtic is not very closely related to Greek. So, you know, in all those groups, you have, you've got this one large group, Germanic, Balto-Slavic, Armenian, Celtic, Italic, and Greek, and Indo-Iranian kind of stands outside because it's got some things that don't seem to fit. And what scholars want to determine, and that's largely what this book is about, In Search of the Indo-Europeans, um, one of the other books I had up in here also, uh, is about is trying to determine when the languages broke off. Here's another way of showing it. Okay. This is showing primeval Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European, and then it branches. And notice the branch. This this is August Schlieker. August Schlieker was a 19th century archaeologist. He thought this is how it broke off. Indo Greco, uh, Ario Greco, Italo Celtic. That is, these four groups are all related. Slavo Germanic are all related. Right? He's not saying that Indic is the last form. He's just saying that this is how these groups break out uh, into. Okay? Questions? Comments completely lost. Okay, what we'll do, um, turn it off. Next week, we won't, we won't have to spend any time, um, according to what's on the syllabus, going over uh, any more of the background of Indo-European, uh, background of Germanic, because we've done it all. So we'll have the exam next week, um, and we'll probably just have the exam. So we'll just have the exam in leave. Be prepared, as I said last week or a week before, for possible transcription passage. I'll send a, uh, I might have done it already.